There we go. That's Townscaper. Uh, my voice is a little bit limited today. I can go this high. Look. Oh. oh. So, so I'll have to speak a little bit darker than I normally do, which is probably good because it makes me seem more sort of authoritative and wise uh, than I actually am. Um, yeah, so this is Townscaper. Oh, geez, uh, that screen is just flickering with, that's quite distracting. Um, excuse me, the, you fixed that. Yeah, that was just flickering with like all kinds of different weird colors. Um, it would have given me epilepsy or something. But yeah, uh, this is Townscaper. This is the last game I made. Uh, has anyone played it? Few people. Has anyone seen it on Twitter? Ah, oh, it's everyone. Yeah, it's a big Twitter game. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about how Townscaper came to be, why I made it, and some of the technical things behind it, and also the design the decisions behind it, sort of, and how it has gone and stuff like that. It's like a general review uh, of Townscaper. Uh, so let's start. A long, long time ago, before most of you were born, I worked at uh, Ubisoft Massive, uh, on a little game called uh, The Division. Um, it, uh, Division is set in New York City, and apparently if you make a game set in New York City, there's a lot of houses there, so you need to build a lot of houses. Uh, so they needed to, well, we needed to build a house building tool. I wasn't part of the process of making that house building tool, but I kind of watched it from the sidelines and was quite interested in the kind of problem solving that it involved. They went for a fairly sort of straightforward approach where you know you build a polygon and then you extrude outwards and just duplicate the walls and you have corner pieces and stuff like that. Uh, that's cool, it works for most sort of realistic houses. But as I was looking at that, I was thinking, hmm, is there a way to build this kind of tool in a more generalized way that could account for weirder shapes. Like both weirder shapes that you actually do see in houses, so like a wall goes like this and then like that and like that, those kind of shapes, but also you know, slightly even weirder shapes like with arches and stuff like that. So basically like if it, the house was just a pure voxel space, could you dress it up like a nice looking house? So then just um, on my spare time as I was working on Ubisoft, I uh, made this little thing called Brick Block. Uh, exploring that topic, and I came up with a, with a fairly nice generalized approach uh, to it. Uh, I released it as just um, a free web demo for anyone to play. Uh, for students, this is also a kind of a process I would recommend, that if you're doing experimental stuff, just wrapping it up into something that you can, well, put on the web, for example, is a great way of doing it, then you're kind of, you get into the shipping mindset, you make a finalized project, you polish up the last little pieces, you kind of start to see things in a different light when you realize that, oh, I'm actually gonna show this to other people who like, I won't be next to to explain how things work. Um, so I made that, it got like, shared around quite a lot. I was pretty happy about that. Um, one thing with BrickBlock though is I kept the grid very, very small. So it's like, uh, what is it, seven by seven or something like that. And the reason I did that is, as anyone who's worked with tile-based uh, games would know, is that if you start, like when you have a large grid, it starts to look too repetitive. Because if, if all your details are contained within a tile, they're, they're, you know, they're limited by that size. So if you start making it bigger, it starts to look too repetitive and doesn't look as good. So I kept it small instead. Um, but I was, I, I, it kind of raised the question in my mind, but like, oh, how would I approach making an environment like this larger? How would I um, sort of get the ability to make larger scale uh, shapes and patterns that cover larger areas so that I, I would get to build a larger town environment, urban environment that still looks good. Uh, I came across an algorithm. Uh, the one I came across is called Wave Function Collapse, and I've been calling it Wave Function Collapse ever since, and that means like everyone else on Game Dev Twitter calls it Wave Function Collapse too. Actually, it's more, the one I'm using is more similar to one called mod Model Synthesis that I just learned about fairly recently, uh, so I've been using the wrong name all this time. I'll, yeah. I'll probably keep calling it Wave Function Collapse now just because that's the word I, I'm used to. Um, but what it essentially does is it, you can give it a bunch of tiles, uh, and then if you have the right adjacency data, so you know which tiles fit together with which tiles, it can figure out automatically how to create a coherent environment you know, without any seams and without any gaps from those tiles. So that's super useful. Uh, and th so that means that you can have features and shapes that uh, sort of 
that cover greater areas than just a single tile. So some examples are obviously the uh, just the little staircases here, right? So that goes from one tile to another tile. All the features are not contained. The little sort of trimming here, stuff like that. Um, so this was around the time where I was, I, I started experimenting with this and then figured, hmm, this might be a, a, a good time to start an indie career and turn this, like put a game on top of this and turn this into an actual project I can sell. Um, turns out though, like I really like these kind of colorful architecture environments. Uh, so I tried to come up with like a peaceful, calm game I could put on top of it. I didn't manage to. Apparently, designing peaceful games is actually quite difficult. Um, also, if you make these kind of very colorful environments, it's very hard to also have a game on top of that. Because if the, if the environment is colorful and detailed, then the game has to be even more colorful to kind of get your attention from the environment. Uh, so it all kind, kind of becomes a bit too much. So I went the complete opposite direction surrendered, uh, removed all the color from the environments, and put in violence instead. Uh, <laughs> so I had a, like a two-year interlude where I made Bad North, uh, it's a game I'm very proud of. Uh, but yeah, so uh, there I, I, I changed the approach completely and thought of the environments as um, a canvas for the game to take place on top of. So the environment is supposed to look beautiful. It's supposed to have a little bit of detail that you can notice you know, when you're actually looking at it. But mostly, the environments are supposed to cater to the, the relevant uh, abstractions of the game. So you know which areas are walkable, which are not. And mostly, leave the visual space for the gameplay element. So in this case, that means the little armies. Uh, so that was all fun. Bad North, the project I'm very proud of. It did quite well. Uh, in fact, it did. It did well enough so I could start sort of uh, thinking about, like return to the, after I was done with this, I wanted to return to the topic of architecture and, and wanted to finally make these kind of beautiful, uh, colorful buildings. And a technical thing I hadn't really thought, of, managed to figure out is how to sort of square the circle of organic towns, like old nice European towns. This is, does anyone know which, where this is? Anyone have a guess? Yeah, you know, no? It's Copenhagen. Yeah, well, um, so a thing you can, if you look at a picture like this and analyze it, it's like most of the houses are actually sort of rectangular. They are mostly made out of sort of right angles. But when you zoom out quite a bit, you'll see that little skews in every single one of the houses like uh, actually adds up to pretty big, smooth shapes like that. So I, I tried to come up with a solution to like, hmm, how do you combine these things? How do you combine the? And also, of course, like right angles are nice because then you can make standardized modules and fit them together. And you know, yeah, because if you do modular things, everything needs to be standardized. But then, how do you make the big curve shapes? And I had a great opportunity to try out this in a completely different game called Night Call. So it's also published by the same publisher, Raw Fury, that published um, uh, Bad North. Um, it's a couple of French guys making a taxi game set in Paris, basically. And it's, most, you're mostly, it's mostly a dialogue game, but they need a view of Paris swooshing by in the background, as you're, like a very blurred view of Paris swooshing by in the background as you're driving the taxi. Didn't have to look perfect, didn't have to look exactly like Paris, but it had to exactly follow the streetscape of Paris. So, because they have like a GPS view of the actual Paris. So if you turn around, you can't like drive through a building or anything like that. Um, so I, that was a perfect, they asked me for some help to do that kind of background for them. Uh, and that's what a perfect opportunity to try these kind of, like, can I do these kind of houses in a curved, densely um, packed urban environment? And I came up with a solution where I, where I did use square tiles, but then I would just kind of make a wonky grid and make the grid out of quads, but they don't have to be perfectly right angled. So you take your square tiles and you do a sort of uh, lattice deformation or cage deformation on them, and then you can squeeze them in to fit on any, on a quad a four-cornered uh, polygon of any shape. And as long as you know, your, your pieces um, uh, like fit seamlessly together, the whole thing will fit seamlessly together like this. Uh, so this is like based on an, an open source street map of Paris that I just extract sort of um, uh, blocks, city blocks from, and then just fill them up with uh, uh, little tiles like that. Uh, it, it, worked, it, it worked actually much, much better than I expected. I thought the skewed, uh, it would look um, quite skewed, but especially from a street view level, you don't think about it at all. It looks perfectly fine. Like from above, you can see that some of the house pieces are like a, maybe a bit too skewed. Uh, 
But that kind of made me think about, okay, I want to explore this further. This seems super promising. And if I'm not constrained by, because actually filling arbitrary polygons with quads is actually is, is quite of a technically difficult project. And I have several locations where I was trying to, you see how I like fill them in like a circle like that? And then the circle wouldn't stop in the middle. It would turn on itself and then start expanding into infinity instead of being like inside out. Uh, so you need to do a bunch of like intersection tests to make sure you're not like doing that. But I figured if you're not constrained by an actual street grid, you might be able to do this a lot uh, easier. Uh, so I asked around and s uh, to see if anyone know a, uh, knew a good algorithm to do this kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> this, is like, this is not gibberish. Uh, let's go through it a little bit. Like, uh, yeah, the first part is easy. Uh, aperiodic just means not repeating. So you don't see the same kind of pattern over and over again. Uh, infinite, we know that, stretches on forever. Uh, deterministic in this kind of context just means that what it looks like is not dependent on where you start generating it. Because otherwise, like, if you start generating one area and then start building on that, you might get a different result than if you start generating from another area, and this is not what I wanted. Uh, relaxed, just that it looks a bit smooth. And quadrilateral, yeah, that just means that it's all made out of quads. Uh, apparently, no one had a good answer to this. Uh, I was shocked to find out. Uh, but I came up with an approach myself that I really, really liked and I'm quite proud of. Uh, so obviously hexagons, they can tile the, the plane, they can fill the plane. So if you take a, you fill up a hexagon with triangles, uh, and then you randomly uh, remove edges between the triangles, that turns those like two triangles into a quad. And you can do that for a bit, and then you'll have a hexagon mostly filled with quads, but also some triangles. And here's the clever part. Then you can just subdivide all the quads, so all the quads turn into four new quads that are smaller. But also, all the tri you can subdivide the triangles, and every triangle turns into three quads. Uh, so like any polygonal shape you have, you can subdivide it, and then everything's made out of quads. It's perfect. Um, and it also, this kind of approach didn't need any intersection text. It couldn't like fold on itself and you know, generate to infinity. Um, you could tile several of these next to each other. Uh, and yeah, then you could make it infinite if you just seed the, the only random process is which of the triangles are joined into quads. Uh, so if you just seed that you know, deterministically for all the little hexagon patches, you get a, yeah, a deterministic infinite quadrilateral grid. The smoothing, smoothing everything together was a little bit tricky. We won't get uh, too deep into that. But it involves like generating further out than you actually need um, to smooth things together. Um, yeah, so then I basically had everything I needed. And the next thing I did was uh, basically combine the Voxel editing from BrickBlock, the first little thing I showed, um, the kind of mesh deformation that I implemented in Nightcall, and the wave function collapse algorithm that makes all the tiles fit together that I had for Bad North. And if I put all those two together, I get something that looks like this. And this, you know, obviously looks exactly like Townscaper. Um, this was like a, f I, I kind of knew exactly what, what I was doing as I was doing this. I was just combining things I'd done before. So this was actually a fairly quick process. I think it's three months between that one and that one. Um, and a lot of that time was just made spent building all the different parts. Um, yeah, I think that's my last slide. And now that we are in sort of, we've arrived chronologically at the present, and we're going to look at actual Townscaper. So uh, this is what it looks like. You can build. and. Um, as I said, I kept brick block very small because I didn't have the kind of larger scale patterns that you would need to make it look nicer on uh, uh, in larger areas. But in Townscaper, I managed to come up with a bunch of these. Now I'll actually need my notes to do all those. Um, there we go. So I'm going to talk a bit about all the different patterns, the l sort of larger scale patterns that makes this look good even when it's quite zoomed out and you build fairly large things. There's a nice large town I've built for y'all. Um, so one thing, of course, that I touched on before is that just the wave function collapse algorithm itself allows me to have some larger scale patterns. There are obviously things like uh, you know, varying um, the types of roofs I have. So I have these kind of terrace, terrace roofs, which are like fallback roofs out of any roof shape you build. It can always, it can always be solved by a terrace. But um, if they're smaller and more specific in their, in their shape, you, they can be solved with these uh, smaller tiled roofs or these uh, slightly 
larger tiled roofs like that. So even that, uh, these roofs are like a bit of a larger scale pattern. So obviously, if you just place a single house, the the roof uh, ridge could go either way, but once you place two houses, or you make a slightly bigger house, the, the roof has to go in, in one direction. So that's like larger scale patterns that cater to the shapes you are building in and of itself. Uh, obviously, the different colors as well is a way to create larger scale patterns. Uh, it's kind of in the hands of the user, but they can do things like creating, yeah, larger houses that are made of a single color, or they can make these kind of um, themed neighborhoods with different color palettes. So here's the red and orange neighborhood, and here's the blue neighborhood, for example. Um, another like very specific thing for this is these little beaches I have here. So um, as you're building, you can kind of see the, I think when I have something this large, the algorithm is a bit slow to catch up, so you can see little gaps in it, and then it finishes generating the beaches as well. So apart from, so the tile ba placing algorithm is a very generalized algorithm that you can, you know, it. It, it's content agnostic. It doesn't know that it's generating houses specifically. It just knows that things need to fit together. The beaches are a much more ad hoc algorithm that's just supposed to make beaches. The way it does it, of course, is that it takes uh, you know the, the footprint of the uh, map you're making and then it kind of smooth, smooths it out a little bit and uh, adds some waves to the outside of it. Uh, and that means that you get some much more organic shapes into there. So you don't get the, the footprint is not the sort of exact grid you're building, but it's a slightly smooth version of that grid. And of course, you get the nice variation of if you have large convex areas like this, you get a very la uh, large and nice uh, beach. And if you have like very small areas like this, you get like, just tiny slivers of a beach. And on the convex points, um, yeah, there's no beach at all. So it's, it's, it's a larger scale patterning, basically. Um, Another thing that creates large-scale patterns is actually, uh, and that's very applicable to any kind of game, is uh, cast uh, shadows, of course. Shadows is actually something I added like after the initial launch of the game. Uh, but if we just look at, I really like how, this is something that any like, uh, 2D artist or painter would know, that shadows create these like, large, strange, abstract shapes. Um, I, I like keeping them fairly toned down, because if you have very harsh shadows, you can actually dis uh, disrupt the readability of the environment, because they're so abstract and weird in and of themselves. But, but it really helps with, like, if you have a big, just plain area like this, just getting a little bit of that abstract, strange pattern into it uh, really helps and adds like another extra layer of patterning. Uh, also, of course, shadows have the ability to, like if you have a large tower at one end of the, at one end of the map, it can cast a shadow like at a completely different end of the map, creating a relationship between two places that aren't otherwise connected. Um, and obviously there's, so those are some larger scale patterns, but then of course there's also like a very, very small scale, pa scale patterns, which is like all the little uh, props I have placed everywhere. These little benches and, uh, and bushes and stuff like that. Um, and they are also, they're not perfectly, because obviously all the houses, they need to fit perfectly together uh, seamlessly, so they all need to be skewed to fit together, but the little props, they don't need to fit together, they just need to stand next to each other. So they're not skewed in the same way, they don't get distorted, so they kind of make the whole scene not look as uh, skewed as it otherwise would have. Um, they also saved me in the sense that the windows and doors are actually made out of props, because the way I approach, if we build something here, you'll see, you kind of get a glimpse of, because the algorithm is a bit slow on a, on a large thing like that, you'll get a glimpse of how the house is constructed and you see that a single house is actually made out of a bunch of different corners. And that's great in many ways, but it means that the windows actually end up on the edges between the tiles. Uh, so that would mean either that I would have to build like half a window into every tile, which would be quite a laborious process, and if I want to change the, to like slightly change the proportions of a window, I would have to change every single tile. Uh, but instead, if the windows are just um, props like this, and then I use like a little stencil buffer thing to cut them out, uh, which also should mean that you can, you can, yeah, you can see the windows sliding a little bit from side to side like this, which would, you know wouldn't work if they were actually part of the mesh. Uh, and this sort of the aesthetical, uh, an, another aspect of the aesthetical approach I've thought about is that if, yeah, as I said, if you're making a, a normal um, game game, big part of making your game beautiful is sort of making the game readable. And if you make a game where you have to make a bunch of actions, the game, like the game can't really be beautiful if it doesn't cater to those 
action. So if you're making an action game, it has to be super readable and you need to understand what's going on and that makes you feel clever and you feel like you can read and understand this environment. Uh, but in a game like this where you don't need to act, it's much more akin to um, like a, just a 2D painting on a wall, a normal painting, in that it's good if there all, are all kinds of details in there that you don't see at first glance, but if you keep looking around, you'll start seeing new details uh, everywhere. So it's, it's, I thought of it sort of like a, you know, one of these hyper-detailed children's book, like uh, Where's Waldo or the Swedish uh, Petson and Findus uh, series, for example. So you've got all these little nice things uh, hidden around everywhere. So as I said, there's no, um, uh, there's no actual gameplay to Townscaper whatsoever. There's no scoring, there's no win-lose conditions. And I've kind of, I kind of indulged myself to do that before, because yeah, Bad, Bad North did quite well, so I didn't have to make money on Townscaper. Um, and I wanted to make the architectural, colorful architecture environment, and I didn't want to have to compromise with the gameplay. So I was just like, no, let's just not do a gameplay at all. It, I think it would have been cool to do a proper like city building simulator game on top of it, uh, but that's a huge project in and of itself. Like, a lot of people came with ideas of like just little puzzle elements you could p like puzzle, puzzle gameplay things like mm, if you build certain configurations or find different kind of ways of building you unlock new blocks or you get a score or like you need to build beautiful enough and then you get points or whatever but the thing with those kind of things is um, th they're kind of not interesting games in and of themselves and if you have scoring like that of any kind the user will start to play towards the score instead of playing towards their, just their intrinsic uh, sense of what's beautiful and what they enjoy creating. You know, there are these experimental like uh, psychology uh, experiments where people get to buy Lego things and they actually enjoy it less and do it for shorter if they're paid for each little Lego model they build than if they're not. I mean, if they're paid a huge amount of money, I'm sure they'll, they'll, keep, they'll keep building. But if they're just paid a little bit, like getting a, a, a boring achievement or like a little score, you know, that doesn't, that does, is not uh, satisfactory. So instead of making a, I knew I wasn't gonna build a huge c city building simulator, so I figured let's just not put any, any scoring or any gameplay elements whatsoever on top of it, and let's just cater to the sort of intrinsic uh, creative uh, enthusiasm of the, um, uh, of the user. Um, yeah, and so in that also, I, the Townscaper is also, it's priced very cheaply, and it's very consciously uh, targeted toward the very, very casual user. So always when you design games, and when you design like software or like any product of any kind really, there's usually trade-offs between catering to the power user and the casual user. And you know, it might vary from project to project where you wanna, you wanna um, put that balance, but in Townscaper, I choose to always favor the casual user. So the first time someone opens the game, they should always know what to do, be able to play around and figure it out. So when people have suggestions for things I should add to the game, a lot of those things usually include like making the UI a little bit more complex and making, which would make the initial experience a little bit more daunting. And um, it might, because uh, Townscaper has, turns out, has had a like, very super, super casual audience. Like kids as young as three years old can play this game. Also a lot of um, like older people who like haven't played a video game ever or maybe have only played like Candy Crush on their uh, granddaughter's iPad or something like that. Um, can enjoy this game. So I really wanted to keep the complexity away and just like make it a very simple and easy experience for those people. Also, of course, there's no win or lose conditions, so you can't, if you can't make mistakes. It's ju it just looks nice all the time, and you can even uh, like undo if you're not happy with the uh, with the change you made, or just remove the block you just placed. Um, so, but one of the so you, the only interaction you have is pick a color, add, remove blocks. That's it. But one of the things I have sort of, that sort of is kind of like gameplay I've built into the game is these um, uh, sort of, I call them recipes. So it's different ways of building that creates different things. Um, there's a couple of those. And like one of them we've seen, of course, that if you build, you know, two houses next to each other like this, you'll get a nice ridged uh, roof. Um, there's also, if you build, um, you can make staircases, and the way you make staircases is just like you make little gaps between houses at different levels, and then you, then you get little staircases, and they can be wide and they can be thin. Um, you can make gardens, you can make, and the way you make gardens is simply by uh, enclosing an area, then it turns into a nice little garden. And 
And that's kind of an interesting in that, like, I would sort of like there to be more greenery than there currently is in Townscaper, but the garden approach was the only approach I came up with that was both like technically feasible and very didn't require any additional UI elements or interaction and just like gave you a very clear pattern uh, of how to create a garden that, that would be easy to understand. Because when you design these kind of things, you need to make them discoverable so that a user just clicking around will find them eventually, but also um, uh, also predictable so that they kind of, if, if they've learned how to build a garden, they figured out that you make enclosing areas, then I need to kind of fulfill that promise and whenever you make an enclosing area, in any kind of shape, it has to it has to become a garden. And then there's also the ca classic kind of gameplay idea of, uh, you know, you introduce some new element and then you add a twist and then you add a twist on top of that and you combine different kind of elements. Uh, so there's a bit of that going on as well with like if you just build a garden with like where all the walls have the same color, you'll get an open garden like this. Um, but if you build a garden where the walls have different colors, so they turn into separate houses, it tries to create these little walls that divides the garden into s small parcels, which is, of course, like what backyards in old uh, European cities uh, look like. Uh, and there's even an additional twist where you are allowed to build slight holes in the garden as long as they're like, uh, um, like completely inside a building like this, and then you get nice little paths. So that's another twist. And if you create several, several of these paths that meet at a single point, you get these little statues. So that's another twist. So in a way, that's like super classic uh, game-ish game design, where you just keep adding twists to the same kind of structure and keep rewarding the player with new things. But I don't sort of explicitly reward you. I don't give you any kind of point. I do sometimes play a little bit of a special sound to it, but it's super subtle. But uh, people really like sort of discovering these kind of things. And I'll show you. Um, one more of these uh, little patterns that I added after the initial launch, because it turns out that um, the way I do the, I have this kind of steel scaffolding or steel support structures, these black ones in the game. Um, we'll see one fairly soon. And the way they work, like here we go, and they kind of c combine together in, uh, in, in cool ways as well, so you'll see how they kind of blend together like this. And the way they work is they, I, like I don't have any you know, structural engineering analysis of what you build, so I know where you have to put the steel support structure to make this whole structure viable. The, on, the way I've done it is that the only sort of um, corner pieces like this I have, all of them have steel supports in them, so they have to connect to other steel supports below them, so they kind of force a steel structure to appear. Uh, but it turns out that you can actually, you could find places in the grid where the grid would kind of loop around in such a way so that you could build like you could build areas without any corners to them because you because the the space would kind of bend around it uh, so here's an area like that and yeah there we go I kind of <laughs> so I, I kind of knew that that was a theoretical possibility when I released the game, but I didn't know if they're actually worthy. I've looked a bit for those kind of areas in the game, but I didn't. I, I hadn't found one, so I didn't know if it was actually ever going to happen. Uh, but then as soon as I shipped the game, people started posting pictures and like sharing, oh, here's an area where you can build these kind of loopy structures. And I really like that. And then, you know, initially they would just be flying houses, but then I figured, hmm, I could either try and fix the bug and add, so the bug and add steel structures when there's no corners, or I could lean into this and let you build, uh, and I could add propellers to it instead and kind of recognize that you found something interesting. Uh, so I did that, but then I also figured, hmm, these looping areas, they're kind of hard to find. Uh, so I built some, so most of the grid is generated with the algorithm that I just showed, but then there are like parts of the grid that I've actually like manually created little grid sections that are sort of scattered randomly throughout. So if you pan around the grid uh, before you start building anything, you can find like super symmetrical areas. This is one of those areas. So you can see how there's like a, a series of sort of large uh, concentric circles with a, with a small uh, circle like this in the middle. Uh, so that obviously like caters to this specific um, 
like that's a perfect place to build these kind of flying propeller cities. I also like the design aspect of, because townscaper towns, they mo if you just build them like a normal town would look like, they look like a normal town, not a fantasy town. They even look like they could be a modern town, you know, a town that's been around for a couple of hundred years, but you know, where people live now, not a medieval town necessarily. Um, so this is obviously much more of a fantastical kind of thing, and I like having those things in there, but I like also that you need to do quite a lot of work to discover them. So the game can, of course, it's the same with these kind of steel structures. Like if, yeah, you can, like this, if you just build a house like that, that's not too weird, but obviously this, like this steel structure right here, that is quite weird. So it's kind of, yeah, it starts to look quite normal, but as you play around with it, it can get more fantastical and more, and more strange kind of. Whereas I, whereas I still keep the, the, the basic game when you just build normal things looking like a normal town. Um, and all these kind of different recipes and also this, these different um, uh, symmetrical grid patterns and stuff scattered across grid actually does create a level of gameplay for the power user in a way that people you know, like finding these kind of things. And, and I don't have a guide anywhere telling people how to build those different things. Uh, but people figure them out, and then they make like s uh, guides on Steam, post screenshots of like, oh, this is how you build this thing, this is how you build this thing. So that's also a way of like the power users creating more gameplay and content for themselves without me having to add complexity to the core game that would like compromise the experience for the casual user. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the core about the game design, and then just some other random stuff. So as you can tell, this project takes place on water. Uh, my last project, Bad North, also took place on water. Why do I put all my projects on water like that? Uh, it's, it's kind of mostly because I really like these kind of diorama landscapes that are super focused and you just have one thing in front of you and there's nothing distracting you in the horizon. And water is kind of abstract and concrete at the same time. So if you zoom out, I mean, it is just like a single color, color gradient going on, super calm, easy to look at, but, it's, but it is water, so it is something. So I'm not like, I haven't sort of uh, um, opted out of making a thing that's an actual, you know, whole, like this sits in an environment, it just happens to look completely abstract. And I don't have to make, you know, LODs and like trees that go off and cross the distance and make a whole horizon and things like that. Um, and other interesting things when, when putting things on water is if you make water, you obviously need like reflections in the water. And that's a very interesting, like when you make a stylized game, uh, a stylized art style, you're always thinking about how do I simplify this? How do I make like a, 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 um, uh, an interpretation of this that caters to the, uh, the sort of the essence of this thing that I'm representing? And if you just would just have like realistic reflections of the stylized model, that would kind of be a betrayal of the thing of that kind of stylized approach. So what you need to do when you make reflections is make a reflection that's even more abstracted than the environment that you are reflecting. So the way I went about it here is of course that you are, like the reflection is actually technically just an upside down version of the same mesh that's you know wobbled about a bit, but I choose to render it without any kind of texturing and just the very simple block colors of the things that you are, you are building, just sort of hinting at a reflection like that. Um. Yeah, another, thing that's common between this and Bad North is this the core out art style of um, uh, outlines and lines internal to the a texture. I didn't use that as much in Bad North, but that's also because this was allowed to be a lot more detailed than Bad North was. I find this to be a very, it's, it's, it's a bit of a technical, like as any of you know that have tried to make games with outlines, it's actually more of a technical challenge that you would expect. You need a lot of technical legwork. But I find that design-wise, it's an incredibly, um, convenient art style to work with because it's very easy to, like designing a game, a lot of it is about, the visuals of a game is about sort of adding and removing, you need to constantly balance the emphasis, like adding emphasis to some things and removing emphasis to other things to make the player focus on the right things. And having, and outlines is super easy because you, you, you can just make the outlines a little bit darker and that's give, give something focus or you make them a little bit lighter or completely remove them and that uh, removes focus from something. So it's very easy to balance the whole scene and everything's of course always readable when it has outlines around it. Um, here's actually the whole texture that basically all of Townscaper is made with. It's one 128 by 128 texture. Uh, I figured out a fun way of doing um, 
because uh, I don't only have outlines, of course, I have, I think we can actually even, uh, yeah, we can do like that. Warp, 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 warp. You can see the mesh outlines, of course, and you, you probably recognize all the kind of artifacts you get when you make them too big. Uh, but I also render the textures in a way where I call the technique every other pixel is a line, so that uh, each tile here in the roof is one pixel, but this little line here is one pixel in the texture as well, and this tiny little dot here is one pixel on the source texture as well. And then I just kind of um, warp the UVs uh, when I s before I sample it to kind of scale the lines up and down as you zoom in and out, so they're always sort of one pixel thick on screen. That also, it makes them mesh together super well with the outlines that are also kept sort of one pixel thick on screen. It uh, makes them blend together, and it also gives this kind of two-dimensional look because you have some things that, you know, are sized. They're scaled in screen space and not in world space, and I was like blurring the lines between uh, 2D and 3D. And uh, even more importantly, sort of, because when you're making an, a, a small indie game, you always need to think about your art pipeline, right? Your art needs to look good, but it also needs to be very fast to produce and iterate on. And it also needs to be performant on, like if you're targeting low, age, low range devices, like mobile and switches I'm doing with this, you know, it has to be performant on those kind of things. And this work ticked all those boxes, uh, and especially the, the pipeline, um, art pipeline thing, because I could, I can, like when I UV map, I can completely stretch the UV map. It doesn't matter. The lines are always going to be drawn as pixel thick lines. And I can um, uh, draw the, yeah, I can sample the UVs at, at radically different scales and skewed and anything like that. And it always kind of works. And obviously, this works very well. I, I can only, the lines and the textures can only be at right angles. So it works great for architecture, which is mostly made out of right angles. I'm kind of pushing it with these trees that are also made with um, the same technique. So you can see this kind of jagged right angled uh, lines in the trees. It sort of works. It sort of worked for these particular blobby trees, but I haven't made it work with like larger, uh, more tree-like trees. With the bushes, it works. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, some other general things. The, yeah, the, throughout my development process, I'm constantly, some, as a lot of you have seen, I've constantly uh, posted my process on uh, Twitter, which like I would recommend all of you to do if you don't have weird NDA reasons to not do it. Uh, it really helps build an audience before you ship it so that like a lot of people are interested in the game before. And, and it also helps you, it helps you gauge what's interesting and not interesting. Uh, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't let the mob design your game for you. That's important. So you shouldn't ask people what they want, but you should see how they react to, people, to things. So you should make the thing that you want to make, but then if you want to make two different things and they react much more positively to one over the other, then maybe lean more into that area. And if you make something that you think is super interesting, but a lot of people, no one reacts to it when you show anything from it, that maybe lean a little bit away from that uh, thing. Uh, yeah, uh, so far the game has done very well. It's sold uh, 700,000 copies across all platforms so far. Uh, so this ma I kind of didn't even expect it to make a profit, and it didn't have to. Uh, another thing I was, I choose to make this project because I was, we were going to have our first kid, and I wanted to have a small solo project, so I didn't have any kind of dependent, like no one was depending on me too, so I wanted to be flexible. Um, and this was the perfect pro small, tiny project for just the first year of the child. Uh, so they went much better than expected. Uh, yeah, I think maybe I'll leave it at that and open up for questions. Hey. Can you talk a bit about, you had like little ambient wildlife in each of the town spaces. Yep. Can you talk a bit about their, like their, beha their behavior and like the patterns for placement and that sort of thing? Sure, sure, yeah. So I basically have two types of wildlife. I should probably have more, but I only have those two. Uh, and it's birds and it's butterflies. Uh, so the butterflies are fairly easy. They, they appear uh, when you make gardens and they just randomly fly around. And the way I've done their behavior is that they are they're anchored to a bush, and they can also land on the bushes. 
and then they circle that bush, and then they might switch to an adjacent bush, and then they circle that bush, and then they might switch to an adjacent bush, and it gives kind of a circular orbital behavior, which looks quite natural, but it also anchors them to the garden. They'll stay in the garden, because they, they always have to circle somewhere where they, can, where they could land if they want to land. Um, the other more complex thing is the birds, of course. Uh, it's fairly basic kind of buoyed behavior. Um, so you see they try and flock around, uh, fly, flying flocks like this. I did have to do some interesting, because they need to do, you know, they had to make sure they're not colliding with the houses. So I need to make a nice way of sampling kind of the voxel space, so I didn't have to do like ray cost, but you can get like a distance field sampling of the voxel space so that they can start smoothly avoiding things. Uh, so they can actually like uh, fly through archways and things like that if you build it like that, yeah. Um, yeah, simple base Boyd approach. The Sort of technically, if I like, I couldn't have skinned birds if I wanted to work on mobile, and I can have like 30 of them at the same time. So they just use static. Me they have a couple of static meshes, like one with the wings out, and then I like just flap them like that, and then I just swap out the meshes when I need to change them. So the breeding animation that, and like I use different UV coordinates to store different frames of that animation, then and then it interpolates between those. Uh, so the the birds are breathing a little bit when they sit like that, and that's the exact same system that makes them flap when you make them fly. And then like, I use a different um, axis in the UV coordinates to determine like, um, how fast they should flap. So breathing is slow flapping, but just moves a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, and the birds are sort of supposed to be conceptually uh, halfway between seagulls and pigeons, sort of, because those are kind of city birds. Yeah. Hi there. Um, I have two comments and two questions. Yep. The first one is that I appreciate your game doesn't focus on traditional incentives. That's something I also want to do more so in my work. Um, and the second thing is I find it particularly fun that both the players and you can kind of explore this space, like when you showed like the propeller cities. I thought that was really interesting and hope I can figure out how to do that too. Um, for my first question, uh, and this might be kind of baseline, I hope it's not too much, it's about your workflow. How, how do you organize your different theories. You went to like a lot of maths, so I'm thinking about like how did you balance modularity? How did you balance like trying out these different things without going insane and keeping it all organized? <laughs> yeah, so a big part of that question is that, it, I mean, so Townskeeper was made very quickly in one year, but on the other hand, it was made out of like seven years because I've been exploring the same topics. For, like, to me, it feels like I'm just making the same thing over and over again, but I'm just adding a little bit of a twist every time. Uh, explore like add layering another layer of algorithms or like yeah uh, figuring out a way to mix it up a little bit so to me the my exploration not like I have a kind of core skill set where I know that I can make a lot of things and then there's just a few question marks like a, a new interesting thing I need to figure out and once I have that figured out I kind of know how it slots into everything else so I guess the basic question is just like having a lot of experience with all the other modules and then if you make a new module you kind of know how it all fits together uh, yeah okay and then my uh, oh, there you go then my second question um, I, I'm sorry if you went through this already I was kind of curious how you establish this art style so it like works very well how did you get to this point? Are there like all kinds of iterations that had to be thrown away, or did you have a better idea? How'd that work? Yeah, so um, part of it carries over from Bad North. That's the, the especially the outlines, like having an approach with working with outlines a lot. Uh, but and part of it was actually sort of, uh, if we look at the accidental, like this is from the very initial art style exploration, where I just tried out what kind of textures am I, like what kind of detail densities do I want, and this, Specific. I was thinking of just making a pixel art uh, texture style, uh, but when I was doing that, I was I still wanted to be anti-aliased. I want everything to be anti-aliased in my games. Uh, super. Everything has to look smooth and crisp. And so I, I tried to my, write uh, an anti-aliased um, texture sampler. And as I was doing that, I made an error in the math where I accidentally skid across every other pixel which means that that pixel would just be smeared and it would be a line. And then I just noticed, oh wait, this is, this is actually quite interesting. This allows me to create like, uh, features that I would not be able to create with just pixels and allows me to be much more, take a much more um, liberal approach to texture scaling and, and, th and skewing textures, stuff like that. So then I just like, oh, let's, let's just write this up properly and lean completely into it. Interesting, thank you.
First off, let me say it's absolutely fascinating, both from an artistic and technical point of view, and so many intricacies. Uh, even you know, during just doing the Q and A now with more detail, so fascinating. This immediately once I, I want to make uh, my next game you know, with these tools. Mm -hmm. So, have you thought of that? I said there was an, uh, a button that was uh, really interesting, export to OBJ. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I want to press that one. I want to run around uh, parkouring here or, yeah. or something. Um, do you have any plans for this as a tool or how easy is it to use this already just to, oh, my, my creation, I want it out, do something more uh, with it. I mean, yeah, you can export the OBJ, that's there. Uh, this, I. I'm, it's not designed to be a tool for game development. And that's kind of like, yes, I started my, prof my career as a game developer as a technical artist. And I kind of noticed that the thing that most technical artists do is they make tools for artists. But when you make tools for artists, you have to spend a lot of your time making sure that they can't break your tool, writing error messages and telling them how to use it and make it understandable. And you can't be nearly as weird with the concepts in your tool because they have to be able to understand how to use it and you have to spend a lot of time documenting and stuff like that. And I don't want that. And I also, why do they get to do all the art for the tool? I want to make the art for the tool. <laughs> yeah, so I've just complete, so I make kind of tech art tools, but they're for me. There, yeah, I get to use them. Uh, you do you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Great. But the but the reason I added the export to OBJ f uh, feature was actually because I wanted people to 3D print the towns. They, yeah, and a lot of people did that when I released. So I'm super happy. One guy actually that has done some of the coolest 3D prints actually shipped recently to me, uh, like a little townscaper lamp and a townscaper chess set. So I'm gonna super look forward to receive those. Super cool. Have, um, we have one question from the stream. Yep. Are there any plans to introduce events to Townscaper? Uh, events? Events. What kind Not of Not exactly sure what they mean, oh, but... So then I, the answer is probably no. Things <laughs> happening in the... Uh, no. In the area? No. 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 Okay. The thing, like, mm, you know, uh, if I was a clever business person, I could probably keep working with Townscaper quite a lot and add new things to it and keep exploring, like adding more content and different styles and whatever. Uh, but I'm not, so I've kind of answered the technical and artistic questions that I wanted to answer with Townscaper. It's quite possible that I get stri that I you know get some more inspiration and want to add something else in the future. Uh, but now I feel like yeah, the, I've kind of done the things I wanted to do with Townscaper, and I want to experiment with other things. Like a thing I'm thinking I've been thinking a lot about, something I've not managed to do in Townscaper is slopes. Slopes are very difficult. I have stairs, but they're not slopes. They're just like blocks with a little detail on top of them. Uh, and that's something I want to explore, but it doesn't fit within the concept of Townscaper. Because when I design things for Townscaper, they have to respect uh, the blocks that you are building. Because you're, the way you're interacting with the game is placing blocks, and a slope isn't made out of blocks. So I'll need mm -hmm. some other projects to get to do slopes. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh, hi, uh, great uh, talk. So um, I just wonder if uh, like the the rules for architecture, if that, if that was based on your intuition or if you read uh, any materials that inspired you, for, like deciding um, what will fill the spaces. Yeah, basically. I do consider myself a little bit of an expert in architecture. I've lived in houses all my life. Uh, <laughs> But that's sort of all you need, right? Like, uh, I think video games artists in general, they become layman experts in all kinds of things. They just, go by just going looking at them and figuring out how things go together. Um, so, I mean, so that's basically it. Yeah, I, like, this doesn't look too different from Malmo or Copenhagen or Stockholm. Uh, so that's, that's what I've gone for. Uh, you know, uh, obviously I have to, distort the proportions quite a lot to make it video gamey, you know, in the same way that in Warhammer, the, the hands are too big uh, because you see them from afar. It's the same here. Like, the, that's not the proper size of windows. Those birds are huge. But, you know, when you look at it zoomed out, you need to sort of uh, stylize things a bit like that. So, no, it's, it's just an, um, uh, sort of, yeah, looking at houses and building something similar. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for a, a really wonderful session. Thank you.